All right, study guide section, history of photography. So the very first invention around the time of Leonardo da Vinci, early 1600s, was something that you could see how light works. It could come into a box. You could see an image. What they did is they took a box. They put a pinhole in it so that light would come into the box. And then they put a mirror right here that would bounce the light up onto something that they could see, kind of like... Um, kind of like a, a transparent piece of paper. And it was cool and everything. Oh, I should also tell you, the science behind it is kind of interesting. When light comes in through here, it actually flips the image upside down. So then it would bounce off the mirror to flip the image back right, uh, upside right. So if I'm pointing to you guys right here, and the light's coming in through here, I'm seeing you and I'm going, hey, this is pretty cool. I can see you right there. So it was cool they actually figured that much out. However, what's the problem? I can see you and then I walk away. I'm not taking anything with me, right? So it's kind of like, what's the point? I can see you, but I can see you. So there's not that much value to it. But it was the first invention and we call it the camera obscura. The camera obscura. Now we fast forward. Uh, a little more than 200 years and and we leave Italy where we think they pretty much came up with that idea of the camera obscura and someone comes along and says you know it was kind of cool to see them but it would be kind of cool to actually take the image with us there's a thought and so someone was playing with some some chemicals some acids and some emulsions and stuff and they put them on a plate and they tried to see if they could get an image to kind of burn into that plate have you ever taken like a magnifying glass and if you're out in the sun, you can shine the sunlight through the magnifying glass and it focuses and it'll burn into something. You can burn into a piece of wood. You can hold your friend's hand and burn your name into their hand. Don't do that. Well, in this particular case, they were trying to do the same thing, but trying to burn an image onto a metal plate. And so we're asking you, what is this early invention? Is it Thomas Edison's Edisonograph? Is it a daguerreotype, or is it Nikolai Tesla, the Tesla mat? I made up two of those. And you're saying, okay, yeah, the one he didn't make up is probably the right one. Correct. The daguerreotype. That was a daguerreotype. Let the light in and actually burned the image onto a metal plate. Thanks to the daguerreotype, we have an early image of someone. Anyone know who that is? He was a senator from Illinois, I think. One of the first daguerreotypes right there. Of course, it's been touched up. They cleaned it up and gave it some color and stuff. I'll show you the next image, and I think you'll know who it is. That's right. That was Abraham Lincoln before he was the president. And that is an actual daguerreotype right there. That's a metal plate. That's about the way it looked. And it's thanks to that guy there, Louis Daguerre. So we go from Italy to France, and this Frenchman invented a way to actually take an image with you. So, you know, you just uh, pop out the metal plate that you had carrying around with you and say, look, there's my family. Isn't that cool? And, and the neighbor lady pulls out of her purse a metal plate and says, yeah, and this is my family. So we still have a problem, don't we? So we started in Italy with a pinhole camera, the camera obscura. Go over to France, Louis Daguerre creates the metal plates, and now a great guy in America, brilliant engineer, said, we don't want to carry around metal plates, so he creates a film camera. Film being basically rolls of plastic that have an emulsion on them that captures the light that way. And his name was George Eastman, so he invented the first film camera that became the industry leader in 1888. George Eastman, he started at the company Eastman Kodak. That's him. That's one of his first cameras. They called it the Brownie. It says, you press the button, we do the rest. So you take photos. It would probably do about 24 different photo exposures. And then you'd send the whole camera in. And then they would open it up in a dark room and take out the roll of film. And then they would create little prints for you and send them to you in the mail. And that was one of the first ads. The Brownie camera, a buck. You ever heard of the Girl Scouts, the brownies? There's a brownie right there with a brownie camera. Uh, is a dollar a lot of money? 
probably adjusted today, it'd be a little over 600 bucks. So it's not a lot of money to us. It was about 600 bucks to them. Still not a bad deal. So we just said that we went from metal plates to what? What does a film camera use for capturing an image? This is not a trick question. Film. I actually have you write it down so you get it in your head. We've gone from no image with a camera obscura to uh, a metal plate on a daguerreotype and now to film on a film camera. And now that we have a film camera, we can actually go around, get some shots, and then get them developed, and we can, I mean, we can, we can tour the world and get photos, which is exactly what this guy did, the photographer famous for shooting black and white images of American culture in the 1920s. His name was Ansel Adams, kind of an interesting name. He published a work of his photographs in 1927, and it sold like crazy. He was also selling the magazines. He had these images. That's one of the world's oldest trees. A lot of this stuff was in our area, probably within 500 miles of where we are right now. People love seeing uh, the Old West. That's another one of his photos of the Tetons. And that's also an example of a principle of photography, isn't it? Leading lines. That's also leading lines. And I just really like that image. It's, it's very 3D looking, almost a perspective photo. And there's the man himself. Uh, you might notice he's got his camera on a tripod. He's got a remote shutter release button so he doesn't, when he takes a picture, he's not bouncing the camera by, by, you know, by pushing that shutter release button. He triggers it remotely. He's got some kind of a light meter or a, a measurement tool that he uses. You got to realize this guy was really a skilled artist because when we take a photo today, we take a photo, we, we snap the image, we look at it, we go, oh, that's a little too dark, make a couple of adjustments, and it's out of focus, and zoom in. He couldn't do that. He took the photo, he had no idea what it really looked like except for how good he was at knowing his craft. But he'd send the film in, maybe, maybe he's 300 miles away from a developing place, right? Denver, Salt Lake City, whatever. And then he would take a look at his image, maybe two weeks later, maybe two days later, whatever. So he really had to know what he was doing so that he got the image he wanted when he couldn't just take a look at it like we can. Okay, like I said, Ansel Adams would have to send his film to be developed somewhere. They develop it where? It says, what is the name of the room where film photographers use chemicals to expose their film? It's called a dark room. That was really clever, wasn't it? You go into a room where it's dark. Let's call it a dark room. Well, that's what they did. And they have a little red light in there that doesn't expose the film. And you have actually three different sets of chemicals for exposing it. She's got her salad tongs there, moving the photograph in there. And she can expose it as much as she wants. There's actually an art to it. You can expose a little bit more on this side, a little less on this side. Uh, they call it bringing out the, what is it, the silver halates or something like that. Uh, I had an uncle that had a dark room. I watched him do his thing, and that's the only thing I know about a dark room. Why? Because they're pretty much gone. I happened to do a documentary on uh, Cedar City, a SUU's uh, dark room when they closed it down probably 14-ish years ago. So even at the college level, there's very few dark rooms around anymore. Film does have a different look than digitals. There are, there are many purists that still want to shoot on film, and they like, to, they like to work in the dark room and expose the film themselves, and they get exactly the look they want. And I do like the film look, but digital gives you so many options that are just so much easier to work with. You just don't see this art very much anymore. What countries are credited with the early development of the SLR camera in the 1950s? I'll tell you the countries and then I'll tell you what the heck an SLR is. Germany, Russia, and Japan. So now technology goes back across the ocean, oceans, right? Pacific and Atlantic to Germany, Russia, and Japan. The SLR idea is this. If I had a point-and-shoot camera, I'm lazy, so I'm not going to grab one. Some of you guys may still have these. Um, my mom 
Actually, my mom and my mother-in-law were the photo takers in both of our families. And uh, they would always pop out this camera that had a viewfinder that just went through a little window right here on the camera. What's the problem with that? The problem is the lens is here, the viewfinder is here. When I square up and take a photo, am I framing it up right? We always used to give my mom and Leslie, my wife, used to give her mom a lot of crap because they always took photos where the people were down in the left corner. Well, they, it wasn't her fault and the people weren't standing down the left corner. It just looked that way. It looked like it was centered up right, but it wasn't because you're looking through this window here. So some bright guys came along and said, why do we have to do that? Why do we have to try to adjust and try to figure it out? Why can't we look through the lens? Isn't there a way to do that? But the lens, you know, lets light in to expose the film at the back of the camera. So you can't look through the lens, or can you? Well, they came up with a mirror system. So the SLR stands for Single Lens Reflex, and that's the mirror right there. I like to remember it as a mnemonic device, they call it, as a reflection. So the light comes in, bounces off of this mirror, comes up and bounces around a couple more times, then comes out to where the person can see it. So with this camera, which was left on, when you hear the shutter release button, what you're really hearing is you're hearing the mirror, because the mirror has to get out of the way so that it can expose the film. So you have a mirror that you're looking so you can look right through the lens, but the light can't get through the mirror to where the film is, so the mirror pops up and comes out of the way. So if you listen, you can hear it. Pretty fast. Go quick. So the mirror goes up out of the way and comes right back. But for a second, you actually can't see what, what you're taking a photo of. But that finally allowed photographers to see what the lens was seeing. Duh, right? And the, the countries, Germany, Russia, and Japan, were the first ones to really start making single lens reflex cameras. All right, the next question says, in 1969, what 1969 invention make, would make it possible to capture an image digitally? It's the image sensor, and that's an example of an image sensor. So we've gone from the camera obscura, which didn't capture an image, to metal plates, to film, you expose that film in a dark room, and now an image sensor uh, captures the light and turns it into data. Someone said zeros and ones, or ones and zeros. That's correct. So that's when it becomes digital and it changes the world. There's been moments in history that just changed the world. Probably when cavemen discovered fire, that was the first one. Have any of you guys heard of the Gutenberg Press? So when you could actually set up a press with your book and then just run the paper over the, the you'd ink the, the plates, the little characters and letters, and then you'd run the paper over that, inked those letters, and voila, you have a copy of a page. Instead of a couple of monks taking this one, let's see, Mr. Walker is cool, Mr. Walker is cool. I don't think they said that in Latin. Well... Now we come to another time, 1969, when the world starts going digital. And computers are going to come along, your cell phones, everything you guys do now has changed because of this image sensor invented by uh, Fairchild. Well, I'm not sure who all is working on it, but Fairchild did make some image sensors that began uh, the whole start of capturing images digitally. Also in 1969, uh, there was another major event. We put man on the moon. So the Apollo 11 mission, we, we put Neil Armstrong on the moon. It was a big year for moving forward in advancements. All right, the next one is that an engineer at what company invented the first digital camera, and what's the irony of it? Well, the company was Kodak. What was Kodak known for? Film. Okay, so think about this here as I read this. So it was 1969, they invented this, uh, this image sensor, roughly, everyone was developing it. And now in 1975, how many years later? 
Eastman Kodak engineer Steven Sasson patented a prototype digital camera using the recently invented Fairchild CCD image sensor and a lens from a Kodak movie camera. This camera was about the size of a large toaster and weighed almost nine pounds. It was able to capture a 0 .01 megapixel image, in other words, 10,000 pixels, and it took 23 seconds to record an image to a tape. So it's still pretty crappy as far as you know, carrying around a toaster and having to wait 23 seconds for it to record that image to a tape, but it was the first time it had been done digitally. And again, I said digitally and tape. I didn't say what Kodak is known for, film. So that's the irony of it. One of their own engineers, I mean, it's like, uh, it's like the lunch ladies. You know, they, they cook the food but on Wednesdays, everybody just wants pizza that's brought in. So if the lunch ladies say, okay, we're going to bring in Domino's Pizza, they put themselves out of business. Well, that's kind of what happened to Kodak. It shows here a chart of their film sales. As time you know, progressed and people went to digital, it took a long time. But eventually, because of, uh, because of them inventing the ability to do it, maybe someone else would have, uh, they practically put themselves out of business with film. You just, you, you pretty much don't see anyone buying film for film cameras anymore unless they're really an enthusiast. I'm going to say one out of a thousand photographers. Okay, now we fast forward to 1981. What well-known company in 1981 began selling the first digital cameras with an image sensor? So Kodak invented this, and then this company, Sony, sold a camera, I mean, you could actually buy. They only probably made about a thousand of them, but they did make it and you could buy them. The Sony Mavica. Sounds like a car. 1981. 1981, Sony Electronics introduced the Mavica, an electronic camera that had a resolution of 720,000 pixels. Oh, I didn't tell you about the pixels. Let me, let me stop for a second here. Pixels. Uh, I don't know if you guys know what those are, but it's basically the dots that make up a photo. So you can say, how many dots would it take to make that look like an image? Could you make that image right there with a hundred dots? No. You might call it stippling if you're in Hegstead's class. No, it would probably take, gosh, a minimum of about 2,000 to really make that image like that. So. When you talk about pixels, you want lots and lots of pixels. The image looks better, more, uh, more resolution, they call it. And the first image sensor picture that Kodak invented was only 10,000 pixels. This one now has taken a jump up to 720,000 pixels. So you might say, that's pretty good. But let's continue, and you'll, and you'll decide whether or not that's good enough. So the Sony Mavica was a single lens reflex camera that captured images to a floppy disk. Who remembers what a floppy disk is? Yeah, computers used to use a floppy disk. And displayed them back on a TV. One historical source listed its original price at $3,000. So you paid $3,000 to capture an image, 720,000 pixels, that you could play back on a TV. So here's the first two questions related to this. The resolution of the first digital cameras, was it less than 800,000 pixels or over 1 million pixels? If you're paying attention, you know that answer. And was the cost, the cost of the first digital cameras, $800, $1,200, or over $2,000? Again, if you're paying attention, you can answer that. Um, 1986, Kodak introduced a 1.4 megapixel sensor. So now you have to ask yourself, what does megapixel mean? Well, mega means million. So if you were to do the math on that, that would be 0.7 megapixels, because it's not even one megapixel, right? Now we're at 1.4, so we've doubled the resolution of pixels. So again, Kodak comes back in, and they're going to stay in the game, and they still are in the game because they make cameras, uh, but they're not film anymore. They were selling a lot of film, and now they're not. But they introduced a 1.4 megapixel sensor, making it the first megapixel sensor small enough to fit in a handheld camera. So first of all, it's a camera that you can actually carry around, which makes me wonder, because that Sony Mavica looked like it was too. Well, that was the image I found. 
I'm guessing the Sony Mavica wasn't, oh, well, it says the first 1.4 megapixel sensor, okay. So the Sony Mavica probably was something you could carry around, but the resolution wasn't very good. Now, uh, small enough to fit in a handheld camera. These cameras sold between $10,000 and $40,000. So you paid a lot more for that resolution. And they were essentially the first camera with enough resolution to produce a 5 by 7 photo quality print. 5 inches by 7 inches, a little bit bigger than this. These recipe cards are 3 by 5 so a little bigger than this. And now it's actually something that you can actually show to people. What does DSLR stand for? Well, if you're paying attention, you can probably figure it out because SLR was single lens reflex. So we keep that the same, but it's no longer film. So you might have said FSLR, but now it's what? Digital. Digital single lens reflex. So what's going to change on this camera now? Now that we have uh, the ability to capture digitally instead of on film, that's right, we have an image sensor instead of film right here. So the light still comes in, mirror comes out of the way, and it exposes an image sensor that then uh, captures that data and sends it to an SD card. Uh, but you still have this whole, they call it the pentaprism, you still have this whole thing of the image bouncing around in there. So it's still got the mirrors, but it's a digital single lens reflex. A digital single lens reflex camera, also called a digital SLR, DSLR, is a digital camera combining the optics and the mechanic mechanisms of a single lens reflex camera with a digital imaging sensor as opposed to photographic film. All right, keeping up with the years now, do you remember what happened in the 50s and in the 60s, or 1969 specifically? 1981. Well, now we're to 1987, and we're saying it's great that we're capturing an image digitally, but wouldn't it be great if we could put that image on a computer and now edit it digitally? So, Adobe Photoshop started in 1987 on a Macintosh Plus computer. Yours truly bought a Macintosh Plus computer, probably about then, as a matter of fact. It was right around 1987. $2,000 and it doesn't have anywhere near the capacity, the ability, the storage, or anything that your phones have today. Adobe Photoshop, so they, they called them Adobe Shop, Photoshop CS2, CS3, CS4, CS5, CS6, and then they changed the name to just Adobe Photoshop with two letters following the word, and those two letters are CC. Does anyone know what CC stands for? Creative Cloud. So Adobe Photoshop started in 1987, and now it's all kind of in the cloud, and you pay a monthly subscription, and they update things automatically for you. Student price is a little less than 15 bucks a month to have the current Adobe Photoshop. You don't buy it on a disk like we used to and install it on your computer. You're just connected through the Internet. The company that made the first mass-produced DSLR camera in 1999, that's right, Nikon. If you're in the United States, you pronounce it as Nikon. Pretty much everywhere else in the world, it's Nikon. Uh, it was the Nikon D1, and I actually had a friend who bought one of these. I don't think he bought it in 99. I think it was more like 2000 or 2001, but he brought one in to me one time. He says, I got it. I got the camera. And he was a professional. And I said, wow, that's pretty cool. How much was that? $3,200. I said, you paid $3,200 for a camera? But of course, it was the coolest thing. It was mass produced. People were buying them. If you're a professional, you got to have one. Would you guys rather have that camera or a car? You can buy a used car for $3,200. So in 1999, that's when we saw the introduction of the Nikon D1, a 2.74 megapixel camera. Mega means million, right? So we're almost to 3 million pixels now. Again, we've made a jump of like twice as many as the Sony Mavica. Uh, more than that, actually. Two and a half times more. So the resolution's really good. It was the first digital SLR developed entirely from the ground up by a major manufacturer and at a cost of under $6,000 at introduction. It was affordable by professional photographers and high-end consumers. Not to me it wasn't. <laughs> but 
there were a lot of those that were sold and that really started the revolution and everyone started developing them from the ground up they didn't say i'm going to take a bit of this and i'm going to take this toaster and re redo they just said okay we're going to build this from the ground up all right mobile devices began including cameras in 2005 so all you guys everyone that has a smartphone or even a flip phone you've probably got a camera on it now that started in 2005 they take great pictures, but what do they lack? Okay, what do you think is the difference between taking a picture with my phone and with this? Well, one thing is this takes a better image if I have to hurry. It automatically does everything for me, and it looks really good. If I have five seconds to take a photo, which one am I going to use? I'm going to use this. But if I have like a minute, I can get a lot more control with this. So you have more control over the settings. I've got an actual lens on here. I can zoom in and out with my optics. Ergonomically, I can control things. I've got better control over the aperture, etc. But cell phones today, they're getting better and better. Have any of you guys ever uh, seen someone that puts a lens? In fact, do any of you have a lens that you can actually put on the camera? That helps it, I mean, on the, on the phone. That does help a lot. You can adjust the lens. But um, you still, if, you, if you're a professional, you still want the camera that you know how to work and run all the settings on, and it's better than looking in menus and all that kind of stuff. So the, the control over the settings like aperture, ISO, and shutter speed, and optical zoom. Just about done. These cameras are starting to replace DSLRs. Motherless. No, that's what it looks like, right? Sometimes I think some of my students might have been hatched. I don't know. No, I'm just kidding. Mirrorless. So, do you remember that whole mirror situation inside of a camera? You've got a mirror that has to pop up and out of the way, and then you've got the mirrors in here. If you took those out and just looked at your display, do you think you might be able to reduce some of the weight? That's right. So, interestingly enough, though, you take those out and you spend more. I'm not exactly sure why that is that way. But digitally, you get, enough, you get a good enough image here that you don't need the mirror in there. And some of the most expensive cameras now, and some of the best cameras, are mirrorless. They don't have the mirror in there anymore. And finally, what kind of a camera is this? What category? I heard someone say a GoPro. This is a GoPro. They call that category action, action cameras. And there's a lot of different kinds. You can go to places like Walmart, and Sam's Club, and Costco, and you can find some other company that's making something similar to a GoPro and buy them for about $300, maybe even $100 now. But small little cameras, and they do not have interchangeable lenses, but they're good for mounting on your head. Okay, that's it for that whole section on the history. The biggest challenge for you will be to put everything in order. What came first, the chicken or the egg? What came first, the uh, daguerreotype? or uh, the action camera, or the image sensor, or film. You gotta figure out the order of events and that'll help you with the state test and with the Quizlet.